Okay, so hi everyone, my name's Cormac. I'm going to talk to you today about terrestrial touch across the Triassic. Um, this is a study that I did during a research placement year here at the University of Bristol during my undergrad degree um, and supervised by Mike. Um, so why are we actually interested in studying uh, the tetrapods during the Triassic, which is the first age of the Mesozoic? Um, it's an extremely important period uh, in tetrapod uh, evolution. It begins with the largest mass extinction in history, uh, the N Permian mass extinction, which killed off around 95% of species on Earth. Um, so setting the scene, clearing a great deal of eco-space, setting the scene for a large-scale recovery, uh, which, which changed the composition of faunas um, around the world. Um, it, it characterized by um, disaster taxa zones in the very early, uh, very early Triassic, such as Lystrosaurus, uh, which in South Africa makes up 70% of all body fossils. Um, so it's a very, a very damaging event. Um, then throughout the rest of the Triassic, we see lots of other turnovers. Um, synapsids, do which dominate during the uh, Permian, give way to diapsids, dominated uh, faunas. We see the origination of several key groups, such as dinosaurs, uh, who appear during the Carnian. Uh, around the same time as another event which I'll mention later, the Carnian pluvial event. But throughout the rest of the Triassic, we also see other groups appear, such as the mammal, uh, the very early mammals, um, this amphibians, squamates, and several others. It also ends in mass extinction, um, giving way then to the, sort of the classic dinosaur-dominated ecosystems of the Jurassic and then the Cretaceous. So for, for a period that's so important in tetrapod uh, evolution for both Mesozoic ecosystems and modern ecosystems, we know relatively little about the actual ecological trends um, that these groups are undergoing during the Triassic. So this is something that we aim to rectify. Um, and the last major study um, looking at the trends in these groups uh, was Mike's paper in 1983, which looked at the relative abundance of several of these groups. Um, but we wanted to apply some, uh, some updated metrics uh, to, to uh, a new data set. Um, and we used several of the uh, metrics that Emerson Whiteside looked at um, across the PT boundary, but we wanted to extend these to the wider Triassic. Um, key aims were to explore the trends in the synapsids and the diapsids, um, and the origination of dinosaurs, which is a subclass of diapsids. Um, and then we've got the, um, we wanted to look at the recovery trends from the end permanent mass extinction, and just in general, just the wider turnovers throughout the Triassic. Um, so to do this, we updated, got an uh, updated uh, specimen level uh, data set of tetrapod occurrence from uh, glo globally, identified at species level, but usually analyzed at, uh, at generic level. 45 different localities, which were then added into 21 different time bins. Um, we used to, one of the problems with paleontological data is that you um, uh, have very different specimen counts at all your, form, all your formations. So initially, it can be quite difficult to compare uh, richness directly. Um, so what we, what we did was we used two different methods. Uh, rarefaction, which is, um, I'll, I'll show you over here. Basically, this is a figure that shows what a rarefaction curve looks like. You might collect 2,500 specimens, which might have 22 genera from the Lystrosaurus zone. But you can use rarefaction to construct one of these curves and then take essentially any, any number of specimens and estimate what, what, what richness you would have found at that, at that sample size. So by, by doing this, you can then compare using your lowest specimen count, for example, let's say 100 specimens. You can put all of your formations on 100 specimens and compare them more directly. And we also use SQS, which we've heard a little bit about as well. Uh, other other um, evenness metric, uh, sorry, other species, uh, ecosystem health metrics that we used were uh, evenness. We used Simpson's diversity index, um, relative abundance of, of some major groups, and looked at the body size as well. We looked specifically at the synapsid and diapsid corrected richness through time, and had a look at some, uh, some uh, dinosaur relative abundance as well. So a few results. Um, down, along the bottom, we've got the, uh, the millions of years. Um, and what we're seeing here, the red and black lines are essentially the same thing. They're both corrected richness, but they just derive from the two different methods. SQS is black and rarefaction is, is red. And so the positive sign there is that they both agree in terms of the actual trends that we're seeing. Um, and then evenness is in blue. Um, and so we're seeing three things of importance. One is that all these metrics are increasing right in the early Triassic, as you'd expect. This is recovery from the um, end permian mass extinction going on. Um, we see a major drop in all of these around the sort of 200 million, 205 million year mark, this is the end Triassic extinction. Um, but we're also seeing a sort of drop in um, around here, about 235 million years ago in periods known as the Carnian. Um, there, is a, there is a drop in the evenness here and it continues, potentially some sort of recovery going on here. Um, Maybe a local effect, but according to the uh, other, other, other um, metrics we're looking at, like relative abundance, there is certainly something going on here. 
Um, there's a turnover basically from uh, fairly synapsid dominated ecosystems to diapsid um, uh, dominated ecosystems at this time. Um, so what we can see here, have a look at um, diapsids and synapsids more, uh, more, more closely, is that the diapsid groups, uh, and uh, both, both are increasing throughout the early and middle Triassic. Um, and then the diapsids continue past this, past this 235 million year zone, whereas uh, synapsids begin to decline and never really recover their richness through, uh, during the Triassic. Um, see that diapsids are very heavily affected by the end Triassic here. Um, we know that several key groups of uh, diapsids did disappear here, such as phytosaurs and several others actually. But the, um, an interesting thing is that when we look at dinosaur relative abundance at this time, about 210 to 200 million years ago, um, their relative abundance is, 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 is very high during this period of uh, diapsid extinction. That's not to say that they were sort of necessarily increasing uh, a huge amount in, in diversity, but certainly potentially suggests that they were less affected across this boundary than other diapsid groups. This is their raw richness, and so they're not, they're not really increasing in terms of uh, uh, number of genera, but they, but they don't appear to be as heavily, heavily affected. Um, and then they go on to dominate during the, the Jurassic. Also interesting is that they originate around this period uh, in the Carnian, um, around the same time as this other uh, decline in synapsids is going on. So potentially this, the signs are potentially pointing to some sort of uh, event going on here, maybe an extinction, um, which may have allowed some sort of re ecological release for the dinosaurs. There is a, there is a candidate for, the, for a potential cause of, a, of, a, of an event. Um, the Carnian pluvial event is a period of, um, of, of global warming during the Carnian. Um, and there's, there's now some evidence to suggest that um, Dal Corso et al. found a, um, a carbon isotope excursion right at the base of this, uh, right at the base of this uh, period of warming, uh, which they've linked to a major CO2 injection into the atmosphere. Um, and they've linked it to the Rangelia uh, flood basalt eruption, um, which essentially is modern day Canada. Um, so the, the, uh, this may, it may, have, may have led to a period of warming. There's lots of turnovers in the marine system at this time. Um, we, we see uh, floras on, on land changing and uh, obviously synapses decrease, um, decreasing in richness and then the origination of dinosaurs. So there's potential signs, um, speculation really, the only thing is timing, but maybe some sort of ecological release going on, uh, which may suggest that the uh, origination of dinosaurs was more of a uh, opportunistic replacement than a competitive uh, rise to power, which is generally the, the opinion now. Just briefly at the end of this talk, I'd just like to quickly talk about bias a little bit more in the data. Um, I've already mentioned specimen, how we can correct for specimen count through time. Uh, but a major issue with using time bins um, is that the number of formations that contribute to each time bin is not consistent through time. As you can see, formations in red um, very much warps the total raw richness through time. And this is then the data that's being corrected. Um, so. One issue is that that might sort of leak through into, into our rarefied data. Um, so to, to, ha to have a look and see whether this was going to bias our results, the two things. One was to look at the average rarefied richness through time. Um, and essentially what we see from that is, um, so we actually rarefied each individual formation um, and then check, check the average by time bin. Um, and what we see is that our, our events still, um, all of the major events still occur. Uh, there's potentially less of a diversity peak in the middle, uh, in the late Triassic, uh, when compared with the early Triassic. And we use another method um, developed by Graham Lloyd, uh, which is um, a, modeling, a modeling diversity curve. So uh, what, this, what this does is it uh, assumes that uh, your diversity curve is driven by sampling bias alone, in this case, formation count. Um, and so you can remove it from your diversity curve and anything outside of this gray box, um, we are, we're fairly confident that it's not driven by uh, sampling bias. Um, and and importantly, we've got the end Triassic, the Carnian, and the recovery are all outside the box. So we're fairly confident that these are real signals. Um, so with that, I'd just say thank you very much to a few people. Um, thank you for listening. And any questions? Yes.